Hi, everyone. Um, while you're all settling in, I'll introduce myself so we can get that out of the way quickly. Um, I'm Nick Sweeting. Um, I came to Pi Gotham last year and had such a great t time that I wanted to come back and do it again. I work for a company called Monatical. We're a small software development consultancy. Um, we work out of Columbia, Canada, and New York, and we don't do internet archiving stuff for work, uh, but we do it on the side because it's fun. I am not a professional in inter internet archiver, so take everything that I say with a grain of salt. So I want to talk a little bit about why I'm here today telling you all about internet archiving and why it's interesting. So where I grew up, the internet was extremely unreliable and fickle. We only had 1.5 to 2 megabits per second. Um, it was heavily censored, and maybe this will give you a clue as to where I was. If you Googled 1984, your whole house's internet would go down for about 20 minutes. Um, if you haven't guessed, that's in China, behind the Great Firewall of China. Um, and it sort of gave me a feel for why uh, a lot of people in the world don't have reliable access to content. And when we grow up with solid internet connections, or when we, even when we have one for a long time, we start to forget about the people who don't have access to all the content that we have access to, and the people who are behind governments that are actively blocking content. Um, and it's just something that we take for granted, and it's something to think about. If you have friends who live in a country that's behind censored internet, Ask them one day about what it's like. Ask them about what percentage of links that they try to visit are just 404s. Ask them about what the experience is like to share a link with someone that you know is good, and then they try and visit it, and they get a block page saying, hey, your house has been reported to some central authority for trying to visit this content. It's not a great way to live. So this got me started thinking about internet archiving. Um, when I was young, I discovered tools like WGET. WGET is an amazing tool, um, but on a more personal level, I wanted to be able to share a link with someone from my bookmarks and be confident that if they visited it and it 404'd, there would be a copy somewhere. So back in 2017, I built a tool called Pocket, Pocket Archive Stream. Super rudimentary, it just ran one command. Uh, it pulled your Pocket Stream as RSS, and then for every link in Pocket, um, it saved the page using a tool called WGET, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, it was just a tiny tool. No one was really using it. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think anyone would find it too useful because, you know, WGET was already very powerful. Then Equifax happened. So around the time of the Equifax leak, um, they announced it using a site on a separate domain from their normal domain. Now, this was a big mistake. Uh, as security people know, uh, a lot of your trust in online presences is tied to your domain name. And that's what people see in the nav bar. Uh, and they're sort of trained to know that when you see Equifax.com, you can trust that because it's probably Equifax. But they made the announcement on EquifaxSecurity2017.com. So I decided to do a bit of trolling. And I just ran my pocket archive stream, my, my little archiving tool on their site. And then I edited the output. And then I rehosted it on Security Equifax 2017, or Equifax Security 2017. The fact that I can't remember it is exactly why it's important to not do this. So I posted it on Twitter, didn't think about it. About eight days later, uh, I get a ping from someone in, in my email inbox who's saying, uh, do you know that Equifax has been linking to your phishing version of the site uh, for the last like 20 days because the support reps didn't realize that it was the wrong link? It auto-completed as they were typing. So that quickly made the NY Times, and it got 2 million visitors. It went viral. Uh, I got in a lot of trouble. My Cloudflare account got shut down. I had to contact support because they were like, you're obviously phishing. And I'm like, no, I swear it's not phishing. And I'll try and prove it. <laughs> so when you submitted the form, not only did it try and submit to localhost, the form submission was also banned. And there's a pop-up saying, hey, you got bamboozled. I didn't take your info. Um, but other than that, you'll have to take my word for it. So let me just get back in here. So one of the more interesting comments in the wake of all this was someone on Hacker News who pointed out that my little quote about this to the New York Times happened to be only the, the second mention of WGET ever in New York Times' history. 
And I think that's kind of sad. We should all work on building more archiving tools so that it gets in the New York Times more often because WGET is really an incredible piece of software uh, and it's highly underused by just, you know, WGET some zip file. Unfortunately, getting all the options tuned to exactly what you want is a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, so in my tool, I ended up arriving at this set of options. But if you want slightly different behavior when you're archiving stuff, you'll have to go and research the 100 possible options. And there, there are good reasons why they all exist. So it makes sense and it's well designed for what it is, but there's definitely room in the ecosystem for tools that can do it simply and without having to think about all this. So I just want to demo it really quickly because for those of you who've never archived a site before, this is how you do it. So what WGET is doing here is it's pulling the initial index.html file. Then it's actually looking through the content, finding all of the static files and rewriting their URLs to be relative URLs. And that way, all you have to do is open. You go to the domain of the original site, index.html. And here is a perfect replica of the PyGotham website, totally self-hosted on my machine off my file system. So this is how easy it is. If you want to archive something, you can do it yourself. You can do it at home. But of course it's not perfect. So let's talk about the problems with blindly archiving a site without thinking about the complexities inherent in the internet. So how does WGET handle JavaScript? Right, it's looking through the page, it sees some JavaScript. To WGET it's just another asset. But WGET isn't actually a browser, so it's not actually executing that JavaScript. So what if the JavaScript goes off and does a REST API request that loads the whole page? What if that JavaScript is a Webpack bundle that dynamically loads other content and it has does some crazy URL rewriting inside? WGET is not able to find those URLs and rewrite them properly. So I'm gonna stick, skip to the last point. Please stop building single page apps. This is the single biggest source of pain in internet archiving ever. Just put everything on an HTML file with, JavaScript is okay, just don't go dynamically fetching your whole thing behind the scenes uh, because it's too much magic for WGET to handle. Um, so how do we handle dynamic content like interactive video games? If you want to archive uh, an online gaming experience, how do you do that? You know, are there tools? Can you just blindly archive the HTML and hope that it works? And then one of the most, most difficult considerations is once we have an archive, how do we make sure that it can last long term? What are the properties of archives that make them last longer than others? How do we compare archiving formats? So I want to dive into that a little bit. There's a common standard called WARC, W-A-R-C. WARC is essentially a, a, like you're playing a tape recorder while your browser is making HTTP requests. And then when you replay a WARC file, it essentially creates a mini server that responds, it matches the request based on the URL and the headers and everything, and it responds with an exact, an exact replica of whatever the server sent. So WARC is a great format, and WGET supports saving to it. But there's a fundamental problem. If we're not actually executing the page's JavaScript, when we're doing the archiving, we don't have all the requests. We only have the ones that were in the initial HTML. And this is one of the biggest problems in, in web archiving. And the way around it is to use a headless browser. So enter Chromium. Chromium introduced a headless mode a few years back, um, which has totally revolutionized the, the, the web programming industry and a lot of other things. Because in the past you had to use a web, a, a browser with something called a driver like Selenium, where you input key events and click events into the browser as if you're a human sitting there driving it. But for the first time, Chrome headless allowed us to do things like you can do in Node. You suddenly have a JavaScript environment in the context of a page. So you have access to all of the dynamic resources that it's pulled. You have access to everything that the site has in JavaScript memory. You know what WebSockets it's connected to. So we have the tools now to do perfect fidelity archives of interactive content. So, of course, archive.org, one of the biggest archiving organizations, have, has been thinking about this for a long time. They have plenty of tools. Um, they have something called Heratrix, which is a large suite of software that they can archive a lot of things at once. But they realized this problem a long time ago. And one of the people there, uh, Ilya Kramer, who works for 
another organization now started developing a tool called Web Recorder. Now, I want to show it briefly because it's one of the best things out there. So let's try the PyGotham website again. Now what this is doing is it's using my own browser context, but it's recording behind the scenes everything that the page is doing and capturing it in a work file. And then you can go back and browse it later. And not only will it replay the HTML and the assets normally, but if the page's JavaScript actually tries to go out and make API calls or make other requests, it'll replay those too. So this is a fantastic tool. I highly recommend you try using it if you want to archive an individual site as a one-off thing and you don't want to do more long-term archiving. So archive.org can go around and do this. They can archive stuff. But archive.org is a centralized organization, right? They have some servers in San Francisco, they have a backup in Canada, they have a backup somewhere else as well, but at the end of the day, they're really only one central organization. And history shows us that the central archives are not the ones that survive. Think about the Library of Alexandria. Think about all the priests who've collected manuscripts, and then over the years, they get attacked because they're holding all the manuscripts or the one library where all the manuscripts are stored gets burnt because people don't like knowledge. The stuff that survives are the individual little archives that people make that just so happen through fate to be the ones that end up perfectly preserved in a time capsule buried in someone's lawn, or the cave paintings that were some cavemen scribble, you know, their own personal scribble in their cave with a rock that just so happened to be preserved in amber for, you know, two million years. By making our own little decentralized archives on our computers everywhere, we're gonna be able to much more effectively cover the breadth of content that's on the internet for a much longer period of time than a central organization. And if history proves me wrong, then that's amazing. I really do hope that, that the internet archive can last forever, but we can help them out by mirroring that content as well. So, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of considerations with the actual format that we use to store files. I talked about Wark. Another one is Zim. So Zim is a format uh, used by Wikipedians. Um, Qwix is a company that offers Zim archives of all of Wikipedia. So you can actually go and host your own copy of Wikipedia today. And I'll show you mine, actually. So it'll look like this. And this is actually a full copy of wikipedia.org with images. Guess how big it is? It's only 80 gigabytes. So the Zim archive, with images, the Zim archive format is incredible. And I only discovered it in the last week and my mind is blown. Um, what the QX team have done um, is essentially write a really, really good scraper that crawls every Wikipedia page, downloads it similar to how you saw Web Recorder do it, and then somehow managed to compress six million articles worth of images and text into only 80 gigabytes. So go and self-host your own Wikipedia clones because it was just taken down uh, a few weeks ago and this is something you can actually do uh, to help make the internet a better place. And what's really cool is it's not just Wikipedia that they offer. You can actually download all of Stack Overflow in every language and every Stack Exchange. So I want to just quickly show the list because it's really impressive. So we have Wikipedias, we have archives of all the TED Talks, we have archives of sub-Wikipedias, uh, of independently run things, we have an archive of the entire Gutenberg project in every language. And all you have to do is download these ZIM files, which are tiny, 15 gigabytes for the entire Gutenberg project. Why not just have that on your hard drive? You know, if your hard drive happens to be the one that survives the nuclear apocalypse, the people who come afterwards will thank you a lot. <laughs> so that's something you can do. And when you, when you pull these, you just have to build a little index of the archives that you have, and then it will appear, oops. 
just like this, it will pop up. You'll see like Stack Overflow, Wikipedia Chinese, you know, whatever. I'm still working on downloading all those files because it takes a while, but hopefully I'll have them up soon. So I want to go back to why I initially got into it. Censorship. So we talk about internet archiving as being a tool for content to last through the ages, but it can also be a tool to help people who are behind censored internet sources access content via mirrors or via USB keys that are passed to them. Being able to ac accurately save content, mirror it, or provide it to someone in a static format and then have them replay it is super, super valuable for people who don't have steady internet connections or access to information. And if we all go and we start independently saving things and sending it to people or mirroring it online, it really frustrates the man. I mean, what I mean by that is state level actors get really mad when the Streisand effect happens. If you haven't heard of the Streisand effect, it's when you try and cover something up and by doing that it gets a lot more attention than you ever wanted. So every time something gets censored, go and archive it and rehost it. Every time you see a piece of content that's, that's being suppressed by some powerful institution or person in the world, archive it, rehost it, and republish it. Tell people about it. Because the more mirrors that we have of, of this content, the less able people are to, to quash information access uh, for those who aren't privileged enough to have a, a steady, reliable internet access. So I'm not the only one doing this. Like I said, I'm not a professional. Um, I built a tool called Archivebox, which is essentially a, a suite of tools together that will let you run a local mirror of, of everything you read. Um, you can pass it your whole internet archiving history and, and do a bunch of other stuff, but there are plenty of organizations that have been doing this for decades, and they're really, really good at it. So I highly recommend that you reach out to them. And I want to go into the community a little bit and talk about who these organizations are because they deserve recognition, and it's usually just archive.org that you see in the press. But there are lots of companies that support the ecosystem by writing software and doing other things. So the rhizome.org team, the webrecorder.io team, I mentioned Ilya Kramer, but he's also working with lots of people at this organization. Um, there are, I believe they originally split out from archive.org, but they have a really interesting history, and they write fantastic software. PYWB is the Python library to access the web recorder system. So PYWB is actually a full Python API for everything that web recorder can do. You can interact with pages, you can manage an index, you can save them, you can do tons of stuff with PYWB. It's essentially the full Python toolkit for archiving. Um, and then lots of other small bits of software. Um, the archive.org team has also created WPOL, which is another implementation of WGET which is a great piece of software. Um, the Old Dominion University has a web science team that just happened to be super active in web archiving, and uh, their tooling is really good. They created IPWB, which uses PYWB to archive files and then store them on IPFS. So to jump into that for a little bit, because it's really interesting, IPFS is a distributed file system. And I talked about individually archiving things on your own computers, but another way that we could do this is use like a file system layer that spreads out files across everyone automatically, and then have a centralized archiving service that just archives it to that layer, and then we all store files for them without having to think about it. So IPFS is a great example of this, StoreJ or the other crypto storage coins. Um, there's also distributed file sharing networks like BitTorrent, and uh, there might be one for I2P, like BitTorrent over I2P, I'm not sure. But this, I think, is going to be the future of web archiving. Having either federated or distributed archiving systems where we can input content of our own, including private content that you need cookies to access, archive that locally, but then share a subset of the things that we're OK sharing with a federated network of people who are able to request resources from each other. So IPWB so far, I think, is the one of the only major projects doing that, but I'm hoping to build something that does that in the next year. The beginnings of it, not finish it. Um, the Archives Unleashed project is really, really interesting. They have a whole toolkit of software, um, but they're also like a task force. When stuff happens, they organize together and rally and teach people how to archive things. The other big one is Archive Team. 
So if you go to reddit.com slash r archive team, it's full of archive.org people, but it's essentially a place where people post when things are being suppressed or shut down. And they're called warriors, and they get a list of tasks every day. And it's like, go archive this. Uh, fix this content that has bad encoding. Um, help us collect every YouTube video before they all get deleted. Or most of Tumblr is about to go down. Help us archive Tumblr before it's all mysteriously deleted. You can also check out the Wikipedia mirror documentation that I created, which tells you how to run a Wikipedia mirror on your own. You can run Archivebox, which is the software I mentioned that I created that looks like this. Whoops, I forgot that. So one of the problems with Archivebox is that it doesn't have pagination. And my archive at this point is almost 80 gigabytes. So when you try to load that HTML file, it might crash your computer. But we're working on fixing that. For now, this is what it looks like. So it can take your entire browser history it, if you want. It can take just a list of bookmarks from Pocket, Pinboard, your browser, anything like that. They all export in a common format, so it's quite easy. Um, you can manually input things from the CLI. This is what it looks like. Ta-da, self-hosted. Um, and that's a, basically a, a one-liner to install and, and get running. And it's useful. You know, as you read articles online and they start disappearing, which they often do, you'll be able to go to your own personal archive and see a copy of it. It's super useful. And when you send people links to content that you've archived, you're starting to create a network of fallback sources for that content when it goes down on the internet. One word of caution, though, is if you do archive public content, and then you rehost it, uh, you have to be very careful about copyright stuff. Uh, often content is not really allowed to be rehosted on another domain because you're not the owner, right? And what if you modify it somehow? So be wary of, of copyright. Um, generally, you never want to allow indexing of your stuff directly. Uh, like, don't let search engines find it because then people will link to it all over from the internet and you start getting in a lot of trouble. Um, but if you, if you host it, on a LAN or offline, there are exemptions in the DMCA Act for archiving sometimes, um, and they're only applicable in some cases. So read about it and understand what the implications are. Um, and lastly, if you don't want to archive stuff yourself, uh, you should definitely donate to some of the organizations that I mentioned here. Uh, they do a lot of work, and often they're just volunteers, uh, and the internet wouldn't be the same place today without them. Lots of content from the 90s, uh, and stuff that's you know, invaluable to future generations, incredibly important for us to save, uh, is being protected by them. So to end, see if I can, yeah, there we go. I want you to think about a question when you leave. Do we want the entire internet to be archived? Do we want everything to be archived automatically? Probably not, right? There's some stuff that makes the internet beautiful, and part of that is that it's ephemeral. We do things that we know we might not do otherwise if people were watching, because we know that it'll probably disappear into the endless stream of content over the ages. So think about what you archive, and try and curate what you archive. Try not to just archive big streams of everything, because that'll be harder to sift through later after the apocalypse. Thank you.